Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. So, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. With us today from New York City, this is kind of a little cool surprise because when we originally set this up, we didn't realize that this was going to happen with him. But Grammy Award winning on top of everything else that this man has accomplished, Vivek Tiwari is with us. He is the CEO and founder of Tiwari Entertainment Group out of New York. He's an acclaimed producer of music entertainment from Tony Award winning Broadway shows to groundbreaking immersive experiences. And as we said, he's a Grammy award-winning album producer, number one New York Times best-selling author. I want to talk about that too, and a media financier investor. He's the founder of Tawari Entertainment Group. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. This has been uh, an exciting week for you. On on top of everything else and all the craziness that's gone in the world, you winning a Grammy. Let's talk about that first of all. Yeah, so we won the Grammy for Best Musical Theater Album for Jagged Little Pill, the original Broadway cast recording. And it really, um, I mean, it sounds like like such a cliche to say it's a dream come true. But this one in particular for me uh, is just very, very meaningful. You know, as as I'm sure we'll discuss throughout this podcast, I've had a very interesting journey and I'm passionate about all uh, forms of art. And really to win a Grammy for musical theater album is the the perfect combination of all my lifelong passions for music and for theater and for narrative storytelling and all the efforts that I've you know been working towards in in my entire professional life and also to have won a musical theater album during this pandemic you know where the past year oh, musical yeah. theater has been ravaged you know, all of this just feels so particularly meaningful and powerful. And to also give the Jagged Little Pill, you know, family something to celebrate, you know, at at this period of time has just been so emotional and powerful and wonderful. I really couldn't be better. Life has been good to me in the past handful of days. And, and, you know, with a lot of gratitude, it's been, it's been as good as it could be in the past year. You know, Jagged Little Pill is coming back to Broadway. We will be back on stage before the end of the year. You know, the Tonys also recognized us with 15 Tony nominations. That ceremony hasn't been announced yet, so we're not sure when that'll be. But there's a lot, a lot about Jagged Little Pill that we are very grateful for and feel very blessed, of which the Grammy is a big one. So thank you. Let's back up a little bit. And there's a question we always like to ask our guests. How did you get started in the business? So as I mentioned, you know, I think I described it as a lifelong passion. And and that really is is the truth. I I was born here in New York City. That's where I'm, I'm calling in from. And my parents were immigrants. The family was originally from India. And I grew up in the Lower East Side of, of New York. My parents didn't work in the arts. My dad was a doctor and my mom was an attorney. But they loved the arts. So they were ever since I was a little kid, they were taking me uptown to see Broadway shows and ballet and uh, opera and, you know, all the fine performing arts. And ever since I was a lot out of the house on my own, I was going further downtown to places like CBGB's and seeing, you know, the Ramones play at CB's and seeing Sonic Youth do bizarre shows at, at downtown art galleries and witnessing what at the time was called experimental theater at places like La Mama and the Worcester Group. And, you know, growing up with that, with that, with like the tail end of the punk rock movement and, and sort of the beginning of the avant-garde music art rock movement. 
it was just a fantastic time to grow up in New York City, surrounded by every form of art that you could possibly imagine. And so that was always my dream was to, to work in the arts and really to bring those two worlds that I mentioned together, the uptown world of the sort of fine performing arts with the downtown world of the edgier, if you will, performing, uh, you know, musical arts. And music was my first love. You know, that that was, you know, as I said, going to see the Ramones and punk rock bands at CB's is kind of, you know, w- w- broke the seal for me. All of my projects have some deep music focus. And ever since I was a kid, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to bring those two worlds together. And as I look back on my life now, like I really I'm very proud to say I'm, I'm living my dream. Like, that's what I do. To more traditionally answer your question, I, I went to UPenn and, and the Wharton School of Business in Philadelphia. And while I was there, I, I got a job working for Sony Music Distribution. And I had a small stint at Atlantic Records and at a label called Seed Records. It was one of their alternative, smaller divisions. And after I graduated from Wharton, I moved back to New York City and took a job working for Mercury Records. This was during the Danny Goldberg years. Danny was the head of Atlantic while I was there for that brief period of time. And we got to know each other. And I think he was impressed by me and brought me over to 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 his, you know, sort of new team at Mercury. And I was there for about three years. Mercury was a division of Polygram. And I left when the Seagram's Corporation bought Polygram and merged it with Universal in 1999. And budgets were frozen and everyone was miserable. And as I my dream was always to to work for myself and to um, you know, as I said, to to broadly merge the music worlds with the performing arts worlds. So rather than look for another job back in 1999, I just said, you know, now's the time I'm going to dive in and start my own company. And so I did. And uh, and that was 22 years ago. It's, it's crazy to think of it that way. Breaking into and you have a music background, having worked at, at the record labels, but breaking into the music business is tough enough. Breaking into I guess what you're calling the the uptown arts, which, you know, I would say Broadway, the musical scene, theater. Was that a, a much tougher door to get through or, or were the components the same or did you find it as kind of a new endeavor, but with perils and pitfalls involved? Yeah, I mean, it was they, they were both industries are equally difficult, you know, breaking into music and, and breaking into theater. There's no question about that. You know, I mentioned earlier, my, my parents were immigrants that had nothing to do with the arts. And so, you know, I, I was just kind of figuring it all out as I went along. You know, I broke into music by getting a, a internship at a local Philadelphia publishing and production company called Integrated Entertainment. And that was my first job in music. And that led to my positions at, as a Sony Music field rep. So that's kind of w- where I got my first start there. But, you know, I didn't I, I had a lot of passion as a college student for music, but no experience, you know, and I, I, I was soaking in every opportunity I could at college. I was, you know, writing for 34th Street, which was the arts and entertainment supplement to the college newspaper. I did some work at WQHS, which was our college radio station. I, you know, spent a lot of time at Discovery Discs, which was the, the, the cool record store when there were a lot of cool independent record stores. I know those that there aren't so many of those anymore. But, you know, so that, that I was and, and I didn't know it at the time. But that's what I was doing. I was doing the, you know, the touchstones of music marketing, radio, retail, press, video, tour support. You know, I didn't think of it that way. I was like going to see bands and like passing out flyers for the bands I cared about. And I was, you know, helping at the radio station and writing for the press. And but that's how I got my start. I started learning, you know, I was just walking around campus and anything I saw that was somehow tied to music. I was like, I want to do that. And uh, and I took advantage of every opportunity I could. And that led to an internship, which led to a small position, which led to a, be- a bigger position. And and, uh, and I just sort of that's how I, I broke into music and theater, I suppose, was not terribly dissimilar. You know, when I left the music industry, you know, when I left, you know, left my job at Mercury Records and set up shop for myself, I immediately started doing uh, more traditional music industry things that I knew. I was managing bands and I was doing college booking because I had booked bands in college. So I knew the college booking arena. And that was an arena that um, I, I suspect it's still like this. But at the time, there was um, good money to be made there for musicians. And, you know, the campuses weren't profit centers. They weren't there to make money. So they were able to spend a little bit more money to get some some great 
talent and a lot of the big booking agencies didn't love de- they liked dealing with campuses because there was good money to be made for their clients the frustrating thing for a, a powerful booking agent is that there was they were often booked by students and the, that student would change every three or four years another or sometimes every, every year was all a senior and that senior changed every year and they have to update their Rolodex and one year deal with a kid who is professional another year did deal with a kid who maybe wasn't so professional and so you know I, I found that because I knew a lot of these players from working in the industry they were happy they said great we'll love for you to be the, a middleman so I wasn't replacing agents I was helping them so the point is when I started my company the mu- I started with music with doing some things that I knew how to do college booking managing bands doing marketing consultation for the music industry. And what I simultaneously did was I put word out to my entire network that I want to break into theater, that I love theater, I love musical theater, and I've not really done it before, but I'm out here to help. And I started by doing marketing for some independent theater companies, some local theater companies that I thought were amazing, but that weren't perhaps reaching the, an, an audience as big as they should and uh, and offered my services for free, you know, because because that's what you do when you want to break into an industry. I ended up, join, you know, doing a lot of work for a theater company called Gail Gates, where I wound up joining the board. And we were, um, you know, depending on who you ask, we were the, the founders of Immersive theater we were doing shows like sleep no more you know some 20 years ago we were a nonprofit, and and there wasn't much money to be made in that we were all kids and so eventually we needed to go our separate ways to to do for-profit ventures but that's how i got my start was was providing marketing consultation and joining these really small theater companies and eventually by networking in that in that industry some of the lead producers of Mel, the Mel Brooks musical, the producers reached out and, uh, or I met them. I shouldn't say they reached out. I met them and I said, look, I want to break into this world. And I'd love, I love what you guys are doing with this upcoming show. Happy to raise some money for it. I did raise some money for the producers. So I earned my place at the table, but more importantly, I told them like, look, I want to learn. I want to, I want to shadow you. And they let me, you know, join some meetings that I probably shouldn't have been allowed to come to and be on some conference calls. I probably shouldn't have been allowed to be on and sit down in their offices and, and read documents and paperwork and contracts so I could learn. You know, in all those meetings, I mostly kept my mouth shut and my eyes and ears open and I learned how to produce. And it was a fantastic experience. And some of those producers went on to produce Hairspray, um, which was another very successful Broadway musical based on the John Waters film. And I joined that project. And, and similarly, expanded my education, learned how to produce. And with those two shows under my belt where I had a very tiny role because I did raise some money for it. So in theory, I was a part of the show and I was making some money from that because those shows did well. But really, I was learning. And then after having those two shows under my belt, I felt like now I really do know how to do this now because I've, I've been by the side of some very successful producers on some very successful shows. And then I set out to take uh, more deep roles, more more leadership roles in, in productions and, and and that's kind of how I got my start. And I worked on The Addams Family and Green Day's American Idiot. That one in particular was a, was a huge thrill for me because it really did harken back to bringing my downtown, seeing the Ramones at CB's world together with the uptown world. You know, literally was punk rock, punk rock on Broadway. Um, but that's kind of when I was sort of off to the races and, and was clearly, uh, you know, a, a bona fide theater producer in my own right, not just a, a young guy, you know, tra- trailing and learning. That's kind of has been my, my path. We're going to take a break, get a word in for one of our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to have some more conversation with Vivek Tawari, including I want to talk about at some point your Musicians on Call, which is a nonprofit organization you co-founded. Hey, det här är Oskar Höglund, vd och grundare på Epidemic Sound. Och du lyssnar på The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. 
Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics, all written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. Whether you consider yourself a musician or not, music is all around us and it affects our everyday lives. Whether it's background music influencing our shopping habits in a store, organ music adding the vibe to a baseball game, or a playlist convincing us to keep going on that last mile of a run. I'm Mindy Peterson, host of the podcast Enhanced Life with Music, where we take a holistic look at music's benefits through the lens of science and medicine, entertainment, and business. You can find me and Enhanced Life with Music at mpetersonmusic.com slash podcast or wherever you get your audio. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio, Vivek Tiwari is with us from New York City, acclaimed theater producer, Grammy Award winning producer for the most recent Broadway hit, Jagged Little Pill, which which you also mentioned in the first segment, has been nominated for 15 Tony Awards, including Best Musical, which is kudos to that because that's that's a big thing there. I love what you said when you wanted to get into this business and obviously you went to school, you got your book knowledge, you got your financial experience and figured out all of those what I call book smarts. But you did something that I like to hear, which is you went in and got into the trenches and said, look, I'll do this for free. I just want to learn. And that's a pretty fearless thing to do. But don't you think that's something that we all need to do when we want to get into this business? There's no question about it. I mean, look, I, I've been working for myself for 22 years now. I mentioned in January, you know, just a few weeks ago, we celebrated 22 years in business. But I'm constantly doing new and different things. And whenever I, I enter a new industry, you know, I, I'm humble enough to, to realize I'm, I'm like an intern, like it's a new thing. And I need to surround myself with people who know better than I do and learn from those people and um, and put in the work and and sometimes that means doing a few things for free or just saying like I'm gonna you know do this one thing give my content you know this content that I that I control I'm gonna let it go on this platform and and just observe what what happens because I need to learn now that's not what we do for our for our Broadway shows which are obviously um, have achieved some degree of success when we move them into to other worlds like touring and international productions but when I'm trying my hand at something new you you have to be willing to make make little to no money to break into that field and really roll up your sleeves and and be humble about it. No question. And then when you take on a project like uh, Jagged Little Pill or Green Day's American Idiot or anything like that, you're getting into a venture that maybe is a little bit of unproven ground, unproven territory before. Yeah. You're taking a risk and you're taking a challenge. Is there a certain amount of, I don't know if protocol is the word, but is there a certain amount of work that pre-production that you do to make sure that this can be as successful as it can be before you even get into it? Because obviously Broadway, like anything else, like touring acts and music acts, it's a high risk venture. Yeah, sure. And, you know, I the way that I describe kind of what I do as a producer, to be very honest, is, is I focus on collaborating with high profile music and turning that music into narrative entertainment. That's how I describe what I do. So the high profile music component of that is working with musicians, composers, catalogs, estates for artists who've passed away, songs, et cetera, that are well known, that are have that have some international recognition and fan base and putting it in crude business terms could create projects that could be franchises. And I'm very honest about that. I love nothing more than when a friend tells me you got to check out this new band or there's a new CD you've not heard. You got to go to Spotify and listen to it right away. Or when the world was different, there's a new musical that playing downtown off Broadway with this fresh young composer. I am the first in line as a fan to consume that art and to support those artists. But it's not what I do as a producer. You know, right off the bat, like what I do as a producer is I worked with folks like Alanis Morissette 
and Green Day before that. And I have a project that I'm developing with the with the Beatles catalog. We can talk about that. The fifth, my fifth Beatle graphic novels being turned into a television series. And and that's your novel that you wrote, correct? I did write that graphic yeah. novel. I did. You know, so so. You know, right off the bat, I am working with music that I know has international potential, that I know has has significant fan bases all over the world. So I know that if we tell the so that's the first component. And then the second component of what I do is I say I, I create narrative entertainment, which essentially means story driven work. I'm a story guy at heart. So first, let's figure out what the music is and then let's figure out what's the right story to set to that music. I don't really do bios. I, I, I haven't done. I haven't. You know, as uh, Alanis will tell you, when I first sat down with her, I was not the first. Produ- I mean, she says tells this story very often that I was not the first producer to sit down with her and ask her to do something with Jagged Little Pill. But I was the first producer who, in the same breath, said, "I don't want to use it to tell your life story. You've lived an inspiring life, but I want to tell a new and original story." from what I think of as the legacy of the album, what the album stands for and what your music means. You know, that's what I like to think about. What is the legacy of music and great albums? And let's tell a new and original story honoring that legacy. You know, that's how I approach my projects. So, um, so, you know, right off the bat, I I believe that I'm, I'm working with great music and I will spend whatever time it takes to find the right writer to come up with a, a brilliant new and original story. And that takes a while if you're not just doing a bio that, you know, in which the story beats are laid out for you because it's based on someone's life. You know, you have to find the right writer and the right take on it. And you spend, spend your time doing that. But if you've got great internationally well-known music and a brilliant story behind it, then I'm entering that project with 100 percent confidence that it's going to be successful because people because I know that there's people who love the music and I believe that the story is good. So, you know, that that's, I guess, how I stack my deck, if you will. And then the third thing I always do with my projects, even though I'm best known for my Broadway work, is I describe myself as being platform nimble. And, and what that means is you figure out the story first. For me, that's always based on some piece of, of well-known music. And then you figure out what platform it belongs on second. First, you figure out your story and then you decide, does, is this a stage musical? Is this a film? Is it a TV series? Is it a graphic novel? Is it something else? Is it a live stream experience? And, you know, since, since we're, we're also talking about the business of music, I will say that there is our business ramifications for that. First, creatively, I think it's right. Be, and the creatives love to hear that. Artists and write, writers and musicians, you know, they love when I say like, the, you know, let's not worry about that first. Let, let's figure out what the art is first. You're an artist. I don't want to hamstring you even by saying this has to be a st- on stage. You know, le- like, let's figure out what the story is first. Um, so there's a lot of good creative reasons for that approach first. But from a business standpoint, what, what I also do is I fund the development of my projects myself so that they can be platform nimble. If in the very early days you're developing your, your project with a film studio attached or a television network attached, then – they know they want to know you're making a film or a TV show. You know, Netflix isn't developing for stage. They're develop, developing for their their platform, you right. know, for their streaming platform. So what I do, my company, TEG Plus, is is we we fund development so that we can allow the creatives to, to create and to fit. And, and, and look, at some point or, you know, it's not at the end. It's not after the script is written. But at some point, you know, while they are developing, they realize we realize, OK, this is a stage project. I mean. Jagged Little Pill is also not a bad example of that. When I first approached Diablo Cody, um, you know, she's now nominated for a Tony. She's a bona fide, uh, you know, a, you know, Tony nominated theater writer. But at the time, she'd never written for theater. You know, she but she was an amazing writer. She won an Oscar for Juno. She'd won, you know, w- created Emmy winning shows like United States of Tara and Tig with Tig, Tig Notaro and you know, and she, she's an amazing writer uh, but for a film and TV. And so I told her, like, look, we think this is a stage musical and I think you can write for stage and I'll give you the resources and the tools uh, needed to do that. You know, the, I'll pair you with Tom Kidd, a music supervisor, orchestrator and arranger who will help you with the musical theater structure. But if you think this is a film or a TV show, let us know. If you have a great idea for it, let us know and maybe we'll do that instead. You know, I gave her the the flexibility to be platform nimble. And she thought about it and she came back to us pretty quickly and said, like, no, I think this is stage. Thank you for giving me the flexibility. But it's 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 a stage. But you're right. It's stage. And so we developed for stage. And then 
shortly thereafter, we decided it was going to launch at the ART, the American Repertory Theater in Boston. And so we raised theater financing for it. But I didn't bring that theater financing on board so early enough that it had to be a stage project, you know. And I guess what I'm, where I'm going with all this is, uh, you know, the way I've run my company, if I'm working with a piece of very high profile music, if I'm brought on board a great story, you know, the narrative entertainment component of it is something I really believe in. And on top of that, I'm allowing the creatives to be platform nimble. So if, if all of a sudden we're like, wow, you know what, like this actually would be a great TV show, not a great musical. It's not like, well, too bad for us. We're already attached to a major theater financier. And so it's too late. That ship has sailed. You know, we're, we're allowing ourselves to, to, to let the ship sail into what, whatever waters it, it needs to be at. I believe, you know, you got those three elements in place. You're going to have a hit. And I'm proud to say I've never worked on a show that wasn't. And, and that to me. It's not a it's it's not a secret sauce. It's just about developing slowly and carefully with amazing creatives. Do you envision or maybe it's happened and we just haven't touched base on it. Do you envision a project such as Jagged Little Pill, since we're talking about that it going on multiple platforms at once? Or do you look at attacking live stage before you would do a film or television or a, a live stream on, say, Netflix or something like that? Do you see it as possibly becoming a bundle or is it just one increment at a time? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the world has obviously changed quite radically in the past year due to the pandemic. So, you know, I'm giving you a different answer now than I might have given you two years ago, you know, and, and but but the the honest answer to your question is a smart producer just needs to look at all the different possibilities. You know, they, they need you need to be very careful to know um, or to ask yourself the question, will, will having these two things out there cannibalize each other? Will, will somebody not want to buy a, a ticket because they can see this? see it here at uh, this other platform at the same time or do those two things help each other and and that's partially about your show and it's partially about the state of the world you know hamilton very famously you know released their live stream on disney plus and it was a tremendous success and you know but it would be a mistake to just assume well that means that any live stream will will not cannibalize theater because that's hamilton and hamilton released that live stream after it was a, such a gigantic success that it it crossed over from being a theater success into being a, a cultural milestone and a part of the zeitgeist so you know I mean, and it was also the original Broadway cast that was not that was not performing on stage every night. So, you know, people tuning in to see Hamilton on Disney Plus, none of those people were were, were going to think, oh, well, I've seen it already. I'm not interested in seeing seeing it on stage because it was Hamilton. Now, that's not the case for every single Broadway show. There are some Broadway shows that I believe that and Jagged Little Pill may or may not be one of them. We're not sure yet that if you've seen the, the live stream, a live stream performance of it. Is that really going to be the one or two shows you see as a tourist when you're coming to New York and you only have two shows that you can see because you don't have much more time or it's expensive and you, you, you just don't want to spend more than more money than, than one Broadway show? Maybe you're not going to see this show because you've already seen it on live stream. You'll see something you haven't seen yet, you know. And so with Jagged Little Pill, you know, we're being very thoughtful about that and, and that to be honest, that's why you didn't see a live stream performance of it during the pandemic. It's not that there wasn't interest, you know, but we were trying to be very careful about that. So as producers, I can tell you, we're, we're looking into everything. We're looking to a live stream show. We obviously have a, I mean, it, it, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not revealing anything that any smart person wouldn't already think our book writer is an Oscar winning screenwriter. So obviously we've spoken to Diablo Cody about doing a proper full on narrative feature. Australia is a market that in a typical world, we would think about Australia after Broadway has been around for a while. We've been a big hit there. But Australia has controlled COVID, you know, and when we are we have plans to be in Australia much faster than we would have other, you know, had it been a different world. So to answer your question, a smart producer needs to think about everything. You need to think about the live stream. You need to think about the narrative feature that's not a live stream, but that is a full on movie like a West Side Story um, or like the upcoming In the Heights that John Chu is directing for Lin-Manuel. Um, you know, those aren't live streams. Those are those are full on movie musicals. And we're thinking about a movie musical. You know, we're we're thinking about Australia and other international touring productions. We're thinking about U.S. touring because there are some cities in the U.S. that are coming back online faster than others. And we're thinking about doing all of those things. Do we want to do all of those things? Absolutely. 
Do we do them all at the same time? Probably not, because that's a lot to do at the same time. But I will tell you in a, in a pandemic and, and hopefully we'll be in a post pandemic world soon, that'll change. We will probably do some of those things at the same time, because I think the pandemic has shown that those things do not necessarily cannibalize each other. If you're smart on where you put them out and how long you allow them to be out and if it's touring, how long do you sit down in a particular market, et cetera, et cetera. But now more than ever, I think smart producers are realizing you need to do it all if you think your show can exist in every format and you need to be very thoughtful about the timing and thoughtful about the timing may or may not mean waiting. It may mean releasing some of the things at the same time and staggering out some other applications. I hope that uh, gave some clarity as to what we're thinking. It Absolutely. We're going to take another break, get another word in for another one of our sponsors. When we come back, we're going to have a little more conversation with Vivek Tawari. And I want to get into your book. Uh, number one bestseller, The Fifth Beatle. I want to talk about that a little bit. And then, like I said earlier, I want to get into your musicians on call. Fantastic. Looking forward. Hey, this is Oscar Höglund. I am the CEO and the co-founder of Epidemic Sound, and you are listening to The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Are you curious about Gordon Lightfoot's songwriting process or what it was like working with Prince in the 80s? Have you ever given any thought to what goes into a golf course design or writing a book? I'm Steve Waxman, the host of The Creationist, a podcast about people who create. Each episode features a different creator sharing stories that I hope will inspire your own creativity. The Creationist is available now on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to the business side of music. Vivek Tawari is with us in the studio. You wrote this book, The Fifth Beatle. Now, anybody that worked with the Beatles or it has a love affair with the Beatles knows that there are several different people that were considered the Fifth Beatle. George Martin was one. Billy Preston was one. How did you come about this title and what was it all about? <laughs> so so the title, you know, for starters, it's just a great title, right? You know, the, so so there is that, you know, just just want it's a really cool title. Outside of that, you know, I, I think it's a bit silly to argue over, you know, who was the fifth Beatle, because it's it's not a you know, it's not a real term. It's a made up term. You could argue that Murray the K deserves the term more than anybody else because he was the guy that came up with it. Murray the K, as, as I'm sure many of your listeners know, was the, the radio DJ um, that when the Beatles came over to the U.S., he would say, hey, it's Murray the K and I'm the fifth Beatle reaching out to you. Da, 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 da. You know, so he coined the term. So maybe he deserves the title, the fifth Beatle. Right. So it really boils down to how do you how do you now I'm going to be dorky and academic. How do you personally define what what does fifth Beatle mean? Right. And if fifth Beatle means the fifth musical member of the band, then obviously it wasn't Brian Epstein. Then obviously somebody like George Martin or, or Billy Preston is more deserving. Those guys played on records or, or orchestrated and arranged songs for records. I don't define fifth Beatle that way. To me, the fifth Beatle is that missing element that all great art needs to be successful. And I believe every great piece of art needs that. Every writer needs the the publisher, the lit agent or the publishing company that gave their book a first chance. Every band needs that that manager who is the first to believe, you know, they're Brian Epstein, which is why I think Brian is the fifth Beatle. Every photographer might need their, their first break, the magazine that printed that picture that put them on the map or the gallery that, that put their photos up. Everybody needs a fifth Beatle. That's how I define Fifth Beatle, right? You know, and to be fair to my choosing the title, um, Paul McCartney did uh, say, if anyone was the Fifth Beatle, it was Brian, which is a lovely marketing thing that I slap on every piece of Fifth Beatle marketing. Um, but if you were to look at the full quote, Paul also goes on to say, he says, if, if, there, if anyone was the Fifth Beatle, it was Brian. People very often refer to George Martin as being the fifth Beatle, particularly in the early days, Brian was very much a part of the group. And that's really critical if you listen to, if you read that whole quote, because Brian was there when the Beatles were not a big deal, 
when they were a Liverpool group that was smoking on stage, drinking on stage, goofing around with the audience, were not playing venues any bigger than the Cavern Club. And Brian saw them and said, they are going to be bigger than Elvis. They are going to elevate pop music into an art form. You know, he saw the, this vision for the Beatles that, quite frankly, I don't think they saw in themselves. Brian was the first guy to think, man, if these guys are marketed and presented in the same way, they write songs that everybody are going to love, not just the, the kids at the Cavern Club, but, but the, those kids' mothers. And gosh, those kids' grandparents will love the Beatles, some of the, or at least some of the songs that they write. Um, we just need to present the, the band in such a way that those people will listen. You know, so that to me is what, what it really means to be a fifth Beatle, to be there from those earliest days when the band was struggling. You know, by the time George Martin got them, Brian, Brian had had polished them up and they were and they were presentable and they had already written some fantastic songs. And certainly by the time the Beatles had come over to the United States, they had an image. There was the shy one and the artsy one and the cute one and the rebel and the, they were, had the suits and the haircuts. You know, for us Americans, I mean, I, I grew up in America. The band appeared almost like fully formed, like sprung from the head of Zeus, you know, but like <laughs> nobody, you know, if, if you know your Beatles history, they were a band like every other band. They had, they got in a van and that the broke down from place to place and they played crappy clubs and they played hundreds of radio station visits and had to charm DJs who weren't ne at the BBC and at the, on the UK who weren't necessarily excited about playing the Beatles. They put in their dues just like most rock bands do. You know, there are always exceptions of bands who, who have overnight success. The Beatles didn't. You know, they, they put in that work with Brian guiding them through the business. So that, to me, is why Brian sort of deserves the title, The Fifth Beatle. But look, I mean, if you're just talking about the music, no one influenced their music more than George Martin. Probably he deserves the title, The Fifth Beatle. You know, so, so it, it's, a, it's an honorific, right? Let's talk about your Musicians on Call, which is a nonprofit organization using music and entertainment to complement the healing process. Let's let's dig into that a little bit. Yeah. So so Musicians on Call, that's that's what we do. As you said, we use music and entertainment to complement the healing process. Primarily what we do is our our bedside performance program. So we bring musicians into healthcare institutions to perform for patients at patient bedsides, literally moving from room to room. And that is what we had done. You know, we're over 20 years. You know, we celebrated our 20 year anniversary. Very proud of that. And that's the heart of what we've done until recently, you know, during the pandemic, you know, we couldn't just bring musicians into every hospital we wanted to or where we had performance programs. One of the things we had been doing, it just wasn't something we talked about that often, was we had a virtual performance program in which um, we were either using online technologies or, or tapping into hospitals, CCTV, their closed circuit television networks, and allowing musicians to perform for patients virtually. And all of a sudden, after the during the pandemic, we were one of the very rare hospital services organizations that could continue to do what we do through our virtual performance programs. And it's, it's, it's crazy that Musicians on Call has enjoyed, pro I mean, it's, you know, I, I don't want to enjoy is a strange word, but we've had perhaps our, our biggest and, and best year ever because we were needed more than ever because people in healthcare institutions we're, we're, we're struggling and, and we're performing for everyone, the doctors, the nurses, the patients, and we could continue to do that through our virtual performance program. And, you know, I, I, I'm very lucky to have done many, many things in my life, writing the fifth Beatle graphic novel about the Beatles manager, which we're now turning into a TV series, producing Jagged Little Pill on Broadway, which we just won a Grammy for, which is amazing. Um, but of all these amazing things I've done, you know, co-founding Musicians on Call with my dear brother, uh, Michael Solomon, there's nothing I'm prouder of than that. And for me, it was formed in the wake of losing my mom to cancer. You know, she died from uh, from colon cancer. And she was here in New York City in one of the best cities in the world, depending on who you ask. She she was in the best hospital, seen by the best doctors, and still her end of days was quite grim. You know, she loved music. And uh, and for me, if the, the her hospital room had been filled with music, her it wouldn't have saved her life. Cancer made sure of that. But it would have made those end of days a, a lot brighter. And so that's what I set out to do with Musicians on Call. 
And really to give credit where it's due, I sit on the board now, I'm a co-founder, but man, 20 years in, it's our staff. It's Pete Griffin who runs the, the program, his brilliant staff. Uh, they are the, the founders of its future is the way I describe it. You know, we have projects in every single one of the 50 states. We're talking about international expansion. We've been supported by every celebrity from Bruce Springsteen to Britney Spears. But the lifeblood of our program is not the celebrities. It's awesome when a celebrity wants to support us. It's great for fundraising. It's great for PR. But it's the local musicians who dedicate their time saying, every Wednesday from one to four, I'm going to go into this hospital and perform just the same way there's always a physician on call. I'm going to be that musician on call. And that's the lifeblood of our program. Those musicians who 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 treat it like one of their jobs, They're, they've been blessed with the ability to, to, to make music and music is, is a healing power. And we, and we proved that that's clear to anyone who's who any music fan knows that music has pulled them through some tough times. And so that's the lifeblood of our program is when those local musicians will perform on a regular basis and, and lift the spirits in healthcare institutions. We're doing it virtually. We can't wait until the world is more vaccinated and COVID is more under control and we can get back to doing it physically. But until then we will be delivering the, the healing power of music through technology, through virtual performance programs, in every every hospital we can we can get to, so I you know I'm gonna be I'm gonna be cheesy and and, and promote my wares. Please go to musiciansoncall.org to find out the many ways you can support what we do. And and sure, it's always hard to to survive in a tough world. So yes, donations are welcome. But there, as you, if you go to the website, you'll see there are many ways you can su support other than just opening your checkbook. Um, you can perform. You can be a guide. You can. There's many many things you can do. So so please get get involved. And we'll definitely incorporate that link into our show notes for our listeners, too. Thank you. Vivek, thank you so much. This has been awesome. This has been great. I thank you for, for allowing me to speak about all the, the various things that I'm passionate about and what I'm doing. And, you know, I, I would love to, again, you know, if Brian Epstein taught me anything, it's you, you have to promote your you, the things you love. So I will quickly say that I'm, I'm very excited that I've got, you know, I spent a lot of last year during the pandemic developing, you know, as I mentioned, what I do is focus on bringing high profile music together with narrative entertainment. And a lot of those musicians and composers were home last year, you know, with canceled tours and delayed album releases. So I literally have nine shows in development spread across film, TV and stage all based on very high profile music that, that your listeners will have heard of. We haven't announced them yet. I'd love to encourage you. This is the, the part where I'm going to promote my wares. Please, uh, you know, join my mailing list at tawarient.com. You know, follow me on Twitter at, at Vivek J. Tawari or on Facebook. And, um, you know, over the coming months, we're going to start to announce these projects. But I literally have nine shows that, that we're going to start rolling out as early as the end of this year on television, to, uh, but on some stage projects following that. In, in 2022 and beyond. And um, if you follow me through those uh, those various um, links and, and social media outlets, you'll get to get to be the first to know about those projects. And certainly the Fifth Beetle is one of them. You'll you'll see Fifth Beetle coming to it. You know, we've announced that one. We've we've secured access to Beatles music and that one's going to be coming to television soon. Um, but there's there's eight others that I, I can't wait to be able to announce and share with the world. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Busan. You're out. Finished. Expelled. I want you off this campus at 9 o'clock Monday morning. The state will self-destruct in five seconds.